Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kathy Mickham. I'm the Education Director for the DPC Ed Center. And I would like to welcome all of you to our December webinar on Holiday Hints, the three biggest kidney disease diet mistakes people make. Before we start, we'll go over just a couple of housekeeping tips. Uh, all of your phone lines are muted. You will have an opportunity at the end of the presentation to unmute your phone by hitting pound six. And then after you ask your question, if you would mute your phones again at star six, that would be helpful. Well, you're also welcome to uh, just ask your questions through the chat box, and they will be read to the speaker at the end of the, the program when we open it up for questions and answers. And you will receive the link to the recording and the slides by email. And we hope that you'll take just a few minutes to complete the feedback form that will come up at the end of the program. Your input is extremely helpful to us as we plan our webinars for next year and as we look at what topics to include in our newsletter. So any feedback you can give is very much appreciated. I wanted to say that I am so excited to have Jessiana Seville here today with us. She's a registered dietitian, and I think some of you may have um, seen her, heard her on some of our previous programs. She is, um, she's been doing usually at least one webinar for us a year and always is packed full of information for us. So I am just excited that just that you are with us today. As I said, she's a registered dietitian. She's also um, a, a speaker for different presentations. She works with people with kidney disease, both dialysis patients. She also works with pre-dialysis uh, patients. She um, blogs about the livable, lovable, kidney-friendly food and renal nutrition research. And she did a program for us on the livable and lovable kidney-friendly food. And you can go to our uh, website, and you'll, if you go to some of our past webinars, you will see um, a couple of them by her. She also has um, a website, kidneyrd.com, that also has great recipes, that has a lot of information. Um, and I, I encourage you to go take a look at that as well. And at this point, I'd like to turn the program over to Jessiana so that we can all learn more about what are the, the three tips and what does that all include. Jess? I, thank you so much, Kathy. I am delighted to be here. I love doing this webinar every year for dialysis patient citizens. Um, I just love their mission and the purpose and everything that they're doing. Uh, to support all the folks that are dealing with this tough chronic condition. Um, so I'm, I'm just really grateful to be here today. So today I'm hoping that I can give you a little bit of a gift um, because I want to share with you a few of the three, the three big mistakes I see over and over and over again with the renal diet that really makes it more restrictive than it needs to be and aren't even consistent with the latest research, or the best outcome. So I guess I just always want to remind people how, like, that our health is an investment in our life, not an expense. It impacts everything in our life. And so investing, like the people that are here today and the people that will watch this after, investing your time in it um, is worth every minute. And uh, investing some of our, our funds or resources or, you know, all those things is so important with our health. Um, this is something that I really strongly believe. Our health is just so critical. So I'm going to talk about these three mistakes. I'm not going to give you a preface about what they are. I'm going to go through them one by one. So I hope – oh, I'm sorry. I just saw a chat. Uh, can you guys hear me better now? So I'm hoping – today that you guys see that there is so much that you can do even with having some restrictions and maybe see that there may be some restrictions that you don't uh, that you don't need um, all right so 
Mistake number one, and I'm going to tell you why this has happened in the past. A lot of people are falling into these pitfalls and why kind of getting past them can give you a lot of freedom. So mistake number one is not enough produce. Um, this is the classic, like, enough fruits and vegetables. It's so interesting, and I've heard a million times when people get to dialysis, they say, wow, like all these healthy things I, was supposed to, I thought I was supposed to eat, I can't have anymore. And it just puts people in this flux about what, what, should, I, what should I actually eat? Um, and a lot of times people feel like there really isn't anything they can eat or the things that they're given to eat are limited to like chicken and rice and green beans and that's it. Um, and so because of that, people can be overly restrictive with what they with what they have. They're scared. They don't want to end up in the hospital with hyperkalemia. That might be why they found out they had kidney disease anyways. They don't, you know, they're, they're really scared of their food. So the first mistake that I see all the time is that people stop getting enough produce. Maybe they didn't have enough produce to begin with, and then they get on dialysis and they really don't have enough. So let me give you a little bit of background about the value of produce. You know, our, you know, traditionally, we hear like eat your fruits and veggies and the reason for that is so, so important. So number one, and I personally, I know not everyone loves vegetables, but they are good. Fruits and vegetables add so much variety and flavor and they expand our diet quite a bit. So they're just delicious. Almost everyone has a favorite fruit or vegetable that they look forward to. I know in the summer, for me, um, that that summer taste of a watermelon is just like I, I can't explain how delightful it is to me or a really good strawberry. My family used to grow, grow strawberries in our garden. And so strawberries to me are a, a taste I look forward to. Um, so that's the first reason. Obviously the value is it adds, adds uh, so much to your diet, expands so much. The second reason, and this is huge, is your gut health. Um, one of the most important things in maintaining health is having a healthy gut. Our gut and the research here is just exploding right now, and it's so interesting. Inside our gut, we have all these bacteria, and these bacteria are really almost a second brain in our body. They interact with our body. These bacteria are good for us. You can have good bacteria and you can have bad bacteria. When you nourish the good bacteria, it impacts almost every system in your body. One of the most important systems it impacts is your immune system. What some people don't know is that pretty much 70% of your immune system is housed in your gut. And so when you have a healthy gut, it means that you most likely are going to be the one that doesn't get the cold or doesn't get the flu. People with a healthy gut always have a stronger immune system. The reason produce fits into that is that fruits and vegetables have fibers and nutrients that the good bacteria in our gut love. They love to eat those fibers and things like that. So when you have enough produce in your diet, you nourish your gut health, um, and that really impacts every system in your body, and specifically your immune system. So it's huge. So the other magical part about getting enough produce and why it can be so damaging to limit it um, on an extreme level, which definitely happens with a lot of people, is that it's full, chock full of nutrients. And we're not just talking like carbohydrates. We're talking about vitamins and minerals that are really essential for us and for our body to function properly. Um, it helps us with our hormone balance, and it helps us with our energy production. There's just so much that is packed into fruits and vegetables and some things that we have yet even to discover. They tend to... Uh, you see in the research that they are continuing to discover new compounds within fruits and vegetables that are power, powerful for our body and powerful in helping us. So that's my little triangle on the value of produce. There are other values to produce, but those are the three big ones um, that I want to let you know. So what has happened historically is that when people – end up in a dialysis unit, they're told eat a low potassium diet. Or if they get on or if they get kidney disease, they start researching what's the best diet for kidney disease and all they hear about is potassium, 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 potassium. Here's the thing about potassium that gets confused 
all the time. And when I clarify this, you'll see where you may have a lot more flexibility that you didn't think you had than before. So potassium does not hurt your kidneys. Some people think if I eat too much potassium, it's going to hurt my kidneys. Potassium doesn't hurt your kidneys. Potassium is filtered by your kidneys, and so when your kidneys are not working at full strength, that can cause some people to have a buildup of potassium in their blood. The thing is, is that it varies for each person. So prior to this last year, there was a milligram recommendation that dietitians or professionals were supposed to, uh, supposed to educate patients on. This year, they had brand new guidelines came, come out by our governing board or the people that review our the research, research. And the guidelines are that your potassium goal in your diet should be based on your lab values. It's very specific for each person. Dietitians have been practicing this for a long time, but it's very specific for, for each person. So some people, if your potassium is always running good, Maybe you even come into the di into dialysis and your potassium has been good. You don't necessarily need to restrict potassium. It's not to your health benefit to be on a low potassium diet unless you can't filter out potassium. Um, this, of course, is something that you want to discuss with your dietitian or your healthcare team. What is my potassium goal? How much potassium can I have? There's some people that need to eat a high potassium diet, and there's some people that are restricting, even though they don't need to, thinking that it's a healthy thing to do, which it isn't necessarily. Potassium um, can help can help your um, can help your blood pressure. So getting enough is important. Getting too much, if you are um, getting too much, if you can't filter it, can also be a problem. So the message here that I want you guys to understand is that if you are following a restrictive potassium diet, and maybe your potassium runs a little bit on the lower end of normal scale, you might have more flexibility than you think. So how do you figure this out? First off, if you know you need a potassium restriction, maybe your potassium is always running over five, um, then um, if your potassium goal is running over five, you may need to focus on your low potassium foods. One great strategy is always know and understand what you can have. Oh, and I'm sorry, I gotta change my slide. Um, always focus on what you can have. Having a good list of all the low potassium foods, all the low potassium fruits and vegetables can help you get a picture of all these foods that you can have in your diet. This is one that I use with my uh, clients when we're talking about potassium for those people that need a restriction. Not everyone needs a potassium restriction, like I said, but those that do, we want to know every possible low potassium food that we can have and talk about how we can include it. Um, the other thing is understanding how much of a high potassium food you can have. Everyone is different. I know for my clients, usually they can have one serving a day of a chosen high potassium food if they need a potassium restriction. So we talk about what that favorite food would be. Um, I'll say off the record, most people, it is probably avocado. <laughs> they really miss avocado. So we'll talk about how much avocado you can have um, in a day and still be safe and not have your potassium levels go through the roof. So first thing is that um, getting enough produce is just going, it, it helps in every way in your health. If you feel restricted because of potassium, figure out what sort of potassium uh, goal you really should have because it's different for every single patient. All right, so maybe I've convinced you to add more fruits and vegetables to your diet. I hope so. A lifelong mission of probably every dietitian in the world. Um, how do you actually do that, right? You, of course, can use it just like for a snack, you know, have an apple or, you know, have some carrots. A couple other things you can do, I love this little infographic, um, is you can sneak them in. People that don't like fruits and vegetables, I have a few people like that, like just don't like them. How do you actually get them in your diet? You know, put them in a smoothie or you can shred them and put them in your, you know, your your shredded chicken, or there's a lot of ways that you can put them in your food and you don't even notice. 
Um, I like to make a smoothie in the morning where I use cauliflower. And some people be like, oh, like cauliflower in a smoothie. You can't even taste it. That is there. I use some frozen cauliflower. It's another way for me to get serving the vegetables in um, without having to eat, you know, like a salad in the morning, which for me is not appetizing. Some people like salad in the morning, but not me. So I'll put it in my smoothie. I'll put a little bit of cauliflower. Other people, of course, use um, like kale or spinach or different vegetables. So there's a lot of ways you can sneak them in. Um, another thing, of course, is dip them. Everyone loves, you know, dipping chips in a dip, and raw vegetables work just as good. If you think of any place you're using a cracker or a chip, you probably also could use a raw vegetable. Um, whether it's a carrot or peppers or broccoli or cauliflower or cabbage um, all of, or apples dipped in peanut butter, all of those are foods that you can dip and enjoy and increase your fruits and vegetables. Um, another great tool for increasing them is just roasting them. Just get them hot, sauteing them on the oven or roasting them in the oven. Some people don't like raw vegetables, but they love them cooked. So cooking them or roasting them can add a lot of flavor and make them very appetizing. Um, if, you, if you feel like the burden is the uh, chopping part, like you don't want to cut them up, you can get them pre-chopped in the store. You can buy frozen, unseasoned vegetables, and that also works really good for people um, to add more vegetables in because they don't have to cut them up. Or else you can find a friend or a family member that can help chop up vegetables um, to add into your diet. The other thing is when you come home from the grocery store, if you have maybe 10 minutes, take your vegetables out, chop them up, put them in a Tupperware, and you can pull them out during the week to add to your meal. Um, a lot of people will try and put some, if you don't like fruits and vegetables, try and put them earlier on in the day so that you know that you have them in your diet. So again, using a smoothie, if you're using eggs in the morning, a lot of people on dialysis are, um, are you know, eating eggs, that's a great time to put vegetables in. Peppers and onions work really well in eggs. Um, or, you know, a handful of spinach can work really well. Another fun thing for some people is when you're in the grocery store, look for something you haven't tried before and just get one. Just get one and try it. Maybe it's a different kind of apple or a different kind of pear or a different kind of lettuce. Just get one and experiment. You may find that there's some really good things that you like and if you don't like it, it's fun to have had that adventure anyways, that you'd be like, oh, you know, I tried dragon fruit. And you know what? Dragon fruit was not worth the $7 that I paid for it. I will never buy it again. Or you might say, wow, that was really good. I can't wait to have it another time. I don't know if any of you guys have noticed with dragon fruit. But you know, try, try some different things. If you have an Asian market in your area or nearby, that can be a really fun place to go into and pick out some different produce to try. You don't have to try a lot. You can try a bite or two. But to be exposed to something new and a new flavor can be a great way to increase your produce intake. Um, another thing you can do is set a target. You know, how many do I want to have in a day? This is something I do for myself. How many do I want to have in a day? The recommendation is usually three servings of vegetables, two servings of fruit at a minimum. Um, and having more isn't necessarily bad. So set a target. What would you like? Maybe I'm going to have two servings of fruit. So I know I'm using apples as a, a frequent example. Maybe I'll have some applesauce in the morning, and then in the evening I'll have a little bowl of mandarin oranges. Um, and then for vegetables, I'm going to do three vegetables today. So I'll have a you know a salad at lunch, and then at dinner I'm going to have a big serving of broccoli. So any of those are some great ways that you can increase your uh, your produce intake. Um, the other thing I'll say is that if you can just find some fast ways to cook, it can be really valuable, even if it's just a microwave. If you can find some frozen vegetables that you like, a frozen vegetable mix that you like, and microwave it, put a little bit of garlic powder on it or lemon juice, um, that can be another way to overcome that bar that barrier of time or feeling like it's going to go to waste. The frozen vegetables can work really well there. And a lot of them even come in steamable bags. Like you literally take them out of the freezer and steam them. They don't have any added seasoning, so they're not high in salt. And you have a vegetable that you can enjoy. Um, the other barrier that people will talk about when it comes to fruit and vegetables, they'll say it's too expensive. 
They say, I cannot eat enough fruits and vegetables because they just go to waste. I can't afford it. The truth is, and I'm going to tell you how you get it to a price you want. The truth is, is that fruits and vegetables don't have to be expensive. Um, they can be expensive if you don't take care of them, and they can be expensive if you buy them and then never eat them. That's just like, ah, oh, I'm just wasting money on this. I'm just going to buy processed food instead, which stays on the shelf till I want to eat it. Those fresh fruits and vegetables are really an investment in your health, um, and they don't have to cost very much. There was a study done, and this was, you know, this article that I have pulled up here was July of this year. So it was very recently, and they found that. Um, it doesn't have to cost any more than $3, less than $3 a day to eat the amount of fruit that you need or fruits and vegetables that you need. It's, it's not as hard as it may seem. So how do you get to that point? Produce will be very expensive if you have to buy organic. Organic is almost 50% more than regular. If you're only buying these really tiny quantities at a time, um, sometimes that can be very expensive too. Uh, if you don't meal plan before shopping, that also could be um, could be expensive because you'll buy these vegetables. Um, I actually am guilty of this sometimes. I get really excited, like, oh, I'm going to eat cabbage this week, and then I don't plan how I'm going to use it. So I just have a cabbage in the fridge, and I haven't planned to have the spices that I want to cook with it, or you know, the other accompaniment. So meal planning can really help cut your cost if you're if you're trying to add more vegetables. If you don't look for sales, it can also be expensive. Uh, produce is one of those things that oftentimes the produce that is on the the lower end it can be some of your best produce because it means it's in season. Not always. Sometimes it means the store's trying to get rid of it and it's older. A lot of times it means it's what's in season. So if you look for sales, you can find it for a very reasonable price. And also it's expensive if you don't store it properly properly. Um, if you are storing your produce wrong, then it's going to go bad very, very quickly. An example of that is if you buy, for example, fresh cilantro, you know, it looks all green and fluffy in the store, and you bring it home and you just keep it in its little cellophane bag and put it in the fridge. Within a day, it's limp. It looks sad. No one really wants to eat it. Um, if you will clip the bottom like, uh, uh, like flowers, and you'll stick it in a jar of water, it will keep in your fridge and look beautiful and vibrant and fresh for more than a week. Um, that's often I'll buy the cilantro or parsley. I'll cook the bottom, put it in a little uh, mason jar, uh, just like you have a, vase, a, um, a bouquet of flowers, and it will keep that for quite a while. That's one thing you can do with some of those herbs. Um, there are a lot of different ways to know how to store produce, and you can look those look those up online. Um, so it does not have to be expensive. These are some of your cost cutting tips, cost cutting tips. If you just buy generic, you know, just buy the basic produce that's out there. Buy it in bulk. Sometimes that can be really helpful. Sometimes that's more expensive because you don't use it. Um, sometimes buying it in bulk and then freezing it can be really, really helpful. Uh, if you meal plan and shop with a list, that also will cut your cost because you'll buy just what you need and then you have a plan to use it throughout the week. Uh, you can shop on Wednesdays. There's been some research that show that most grocery stores get their, uh, get their shipments in on Wednesdays, and so their prices on the produce going out may be a little bit lower. Uh, if you buy frozen items, that also can cut your cost because it's going to keep in your freezer. And the quality, the nutritional quality of frozen fruits and vegetables is often very equal to the fresh. Um, and again, if you don't store it properly. If you store it properly, you'll be great. Citrus lasts a long time in the fridge. You can keep oranges and lemons in your, in your fridge's crisper drawer, and you can have them for a couple weeks, and they don't go bad. Um, so for example, those are a couple things you can do. OK, number one not enough produce. The number one mistake people do in limiting themselves is not enough produce. And I hope you can see there how there's a lot of ways that you you could add more produce into your diet. It will expand your diet in ways you can't even imagine. The other two, the, other, the second mistake is that people don't understand their labels. They don't utilize these. They don't leverage these for their benefit. 
When you understand your label, it's like having a treasure map to the gold. The reason why is because you will know exactly what's in your food and you'll be able to pick out and find the products that are going to work for you. When you have a few go-to products, it makes your grocery shopping fast and it also makes you feel like you always have foods to eat. So the number, the number two mistake people make in having a very restrictive renal diet is they don't understand their labels and how to read them and how to utilize them to their benefit. So let me show you how you can do that. <clears throat> First off, real basic. A lot of you guys probably already know this, but I'll give you just a few basics here. Obviously, when you're reading a label, you want to look up at the top what a, what a serving size is, because that's going to tell you for whatever that serving size is, all of this information is related to it. So we'll just say, for example, this is Cheerios. I don't know what it is. Probably not Cheerios, but we'll say it's Cheerios. And the serving side is two-thirds cup. So for two-thirds cup of a Cheerios, this is what you're going to get. And there's a few things that are really valuable for people to look at here. The sodium content, obviously, people are looking at that. Um, I have a lot of patients that they focus on this percentage place, which can be which can be okay, but really understanding your grams can be more powerful. And I'll tell you how much in just a minute. Um, so sodium can be really helpful. Some people are watching calories and fat, so they'll use those, those pieces. Um, the other piece that can be really helpful is potassium that's starting to come on labels. We have to be a little bit careful right now because some foods with potassium, they'll list it as zero milligrams. The, the uh, labeling is not always correct with potassium right now. Usually if it's listed out with an actual number, 240 milligrams, 470, that means, uh, that means that it's accurate. But if it's listing as zero milligrams, you might want to double check that. I've had some dietitians report that they'll get a can of beans and we'll say zero milligrams. And we all know beans have potassium, so that is incorrect labeling. Uh, potassium, you have to be careful, but that can be really helpful. I'll put those numbers in perspective for you in just a minute, but I just wanted to see where you look for those at. Phosphorus is not going to show up on your nutrition facts. Uh, it's a very important thing to look for. You are going to see it here. Oh, you're going to see it in the ingredients, and I'll show you an example here in just a minute. But just on the nutrition facts, that's what you're going to use um, to give relevance for those numbers. If you're looking at sodium, you have to think about how it fits within your day. So on average, this is a base number. Some people have a little bit more, a little bit less. You can have about 2,000 milligrams in a day. So that means you want to aim for around 500 per mil and 100 to 150 per snack. So if you're looking at a label and you look at the healthy choice, let's say you're looking at healthy choice meals, you need some frozen meals for the week, and you say, wow, this has 500 milligrams of sodium. That's way too much. I can't, I can't buy that. Well, if that's all you're eating at a meal is just that healthy choice meal, that could be a really good choice. 500 milligrams would be very appropriate. So if it's a food that you're going to eat exclusively just for that meal, you can aim for that 500 to 600 milligram mark. So that gives you flexibility as far as that concept. If it's a snack type food, like maybe a cracker, Trying to get it on the lower side, less than 100 to 150 would be a great idea. So if you have the uh, hint of salt Triscuit, they're less than 100 to 150. I think they're 30 or 40 milligrams per serving. That would be a fantastic snack. If you pulled up a cracker and it said 500 milligrams, that would be a crazy lot of sodium to give to just a snack instead of having it at one of your meals. Um, so that's how you put in perspective the uh, sodium. Potassium is fairly similar. Again, it's dependent on your lab, so some people can do more or less. A high potassium food is generally considered more than 250 milligrams. Um, you keep it around that area. If you have a potassium restriction, you just keep in mind, like, how does this fit in my whole day? I have around 500 per mil, same as sodium. I have around 500 per mil. If this frozen choice, healthy choice meal has 600 milligrams of potassium in it, that's probably okay. It's going to fit within that 500 to 700 goal. Um, if it was a cracker, there's no crackers with this much potassium. But if there were, 
if there's a cracker and it had 600 milligrams per serving, that would be way too much um, to work to to work in feeder diet on a frequent basis. The other part about reading labels where you can really leverage finding the best foods is finding foods with real food in them and less ingredients. Um, the, the front of labels can be very, very misleading. And I think this, this little uh, comic here is a great representation of how just words can be misleading. We have obviously Pete's Whole Foods that are good for you, and then Danny's Whole Foods, which are donuts baked fresh daily. Um, it's the, the labeling and the marketing that goes into foods is a art at this point in the food industry. So knowing your labels and the ingredients can really help you find what food is truly healthy. They can say healthy on it or organic on it or all sorts of other labeling, thinking, oh, this is a healthy food I can consume, um, and it may not be so. so. Let me give you a couple examples here. So these, all of these labels here, if you look at them, I'm going to tell you, this is a bread here. Look at all these ingredients that are in this bread. Bread, if you make it at home, for example, is yeast, flour, water. Sometimes there's an egg and a little bit of salt. That's a traditional bread recipe, sometimes a little bit of milk. It's like five ingredients. This is a bread at the store, and it has flour and malted barley flour, and then uh, some of these added um, vitamins, high fructose corn syrup. Then it has wheat gluten and salt and vegetable oil and sterile lactolate and calcium stearate and lactolate monoglycerides and calcium peroxide and calcium iodate and soy flour and mono and diglycerides. So I'll stop reading the rest of the label. You can see there's a lot of ingredients here. If I were to offer any of you guys a nice plate of calcium peroxide, I'm pretty sure you would turn me down. And we want to think the same way about our food. It's good if we know what the ingredients actually are when we are eating them. Um, when we eat a piece of bread, in this case, we're not just eating bread, we're eating a lot of other foods. So finding foods that have much more simple ingredients list is to your benefit. Um, also here, uh, this is some type of a bar, and I don't know what it is, but roasted peanuts, chicory root, soy protein isolate, vegetable oil, whey protein concentrate, corn syrup, rice flour, cocoa powder, water, vegetable glycerin, blah, blah, blah. That's a very long, long label for just a bar. If you can find something that's more simple, that also could really help you find the foods that are, are um, to me, much, much better. It helps you get past that labeling that can be very deceptive. If a food touts itself as very healthy, but it has you know 50 ingredients uh, for something very simple, it may not be as healthy as you think it is. So another example here. Here's both uh, peanut butter, right? Peanut butter can fit definitely in a renal diet. I know traditionally it kind of falls on the don't eat this sort of thing. There's been a movement to get away from that uh, because of the phosphorus. Most of the phosphorus in peanut butter is not absorbed. It's not as bioavailable as like what's in Coca-Cola. So peanut butter definitely can fit into your diet. But here's two different kinds. Here's a reduced fat GIF and Smucker's Natural. The Smucker's Natural has peanut and less than 1% of salt. So that's it. That's all that's in this peanut butter. This peanut butter has peanuts, corn syrup, solid sugar, pea protein, um, fully hydrogenated vegetable oil, mono and diglycerides, molasses, magnesium oxide, blah, 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 blah all these other ingredients just for peanut butter. So looking at your label can help you find which foods are really real foods. One of the reasons, and before I get onto the seeds, let me go back here. One of the reasons that I mentioned this, mentioned this whole food part is even just focusing on getting the whole foods in your diet, that can really help your phosphorus levels. One of the main Sources of phosphorus for most people really is the phosphate additives that you'll find in the labels. So this is uh, peanut butter, right? And it has ferric orthophosphate. Um, and that is a phosphate additive, a chemical phosphate, 100% absorbed by the body, and that can raise your phosphorus levels. So sticking on these whole foods not only helps your labs, you definitely will feel better with it as well. 
Um, so when you read labels, you start to get back some freedom, right? Here's this lady. She's like, man, I've been on this diet forever. I've got all these different things I got to think about. <clears throat> If you, don't, if you don't understand them, then what can end up happening is you go in, maybe you look at a frozen meal, and you're like, oh, great, this has cheese. Oh, no, it has tomatoes. Oh, it doesn't have enough meat, so I can't have this. I can't have this. I can't have that. But if you understand your labels, you can get past just the food that's in it and know if it's going to work for you or not. Um, maybe you see a frozen meal, and maybe it has a little bit of spaghetti sauce on it, so it has some tomatoes and you look at the actual potassium content, and it's within your range. You know you could have that, whereas before you may have restricted it. So one of the, the big things, which I mentioned with produce as well, is that you want to find foods you can have, right? When you find foods you can have, that is very, very powerful for you. It gives you so so much to work with. And that's going to lead us into mistake number three that people have. But number one is not enough produce, right? People restrict the fruits and vegetables thinking they have to eat low potassium to be healthy. You just need to eat the potassium level that your kidneys can filter. Some people can filter a lot. Some people can filter a little. Number two is people don't understand their labels. They're, they get stuck on what the food is instead of what is actually in the food. Um, I hope that makes sense. Once you understand your labels, you can find products that work for you. You'll be able to look at a chip or a cracker or a frozen meal or, you know, whatever, and be able to say, oh, this food would be good for me, this one would not be good for me, and you can be your own detective, which will give you a lot of different options. You can start finding a lot of new foods that way. One thing I will mention is if that feels overwhelming, especially with labels, Every person at a dialysis unit should have a dietitian. It's a federal requirement. They can help. These are conversation starters you can have. You can ask the dietitian, well, what can I have? If you've only been told don't eat this, don't eat that, one great question is what can I have? What kind of fruit can I have? I'm missing whatever. How do I fit it back in my diet? What portion would be appropriate for me? Um, you can have some specific guidelines if you need the specific number. What should I personally be looking for for myself for sodium on the label or carbohydrates? Maybe you're, again, using crackers as an example. What should I be looking for for sodium on crackers? And the dietitian can help guide you what would be some numbers to kind of work from. Um, and that way when you go to the store, you're, you're armed with that tool, and you can start looking for a product that you really like. Um, and a couple other questions you can, you can use to really help uh, get some more ideas from your dietitian. Do you have any ideas for a frozen meal? Do you have any ideas for, um, you know, spicy chicken? You know, it would be much easier for me if I could find a yogurt replacement to eat. It would be a lot easier for me if I could find a, you know, whatever, a, a type of cheese that would work for me. Or how much cheese could I have? Those are foods that I really miss. How can I put them in my diet? So those are all some things that you can do to, to use your dietitian to help you. And they want to help you. They love those questions. So some good key questions. If you're missing something, don't just begrudge your diet. Find a way to fit it back in so that you can stay healthy but still enjoy your food. Okay, mistake number three. I feel like this is a really powerful one. The other thing that I see happens for a lot of people is they stop experimenting. They stop trying foods. They have had a certain pattern of foods their whole life. They're put on dialysis, and now they have a lesser pattern of foods because they just took all the foods they normally eat, and then they cut it by half because there's some things they can't have anymore. When you're able to expand your diet and try new things, you will find that the renal diet may not be as restrictive as you think it is. So four things that can be helpful, and I'll go through each one of these. One, buy more produce. Two, um, use some different cooking methods. This is probably the easiest and fastest way. Three, <clears throat> try some complementary foods. I'll show you what that means in a second. And four, use seasoning. Seasoning is a game changer. 
Um, so, for example, I have heard from so many people on dialysis that they feel like they single-handedly support the chicken industry. They eat chicken all the time. They're having it at lunch and at dinner and then at lunch and dinner and then at lunch and dinner and every day for months and months and years and years. They just are so tired of chicken. One of the problems is sometimes people get stuck in only having it a certain way. When you can expand and start trying cooking in different ways, you can really find that chicken, for example, can become a lot of different things and it can gain a lot of different flavors. So some examples of different ways you can cook, you can poach, right? You can uh, pressure cook, you can saute, you can sear it. Uh, you can slow roast it, like in a roasting tray or in your crock pot. You can smoke it. You can stew it. Um, you can stir fry it. You can steam it. There's just so many different ways that you can cook. And I mean, vegetables as well. If you just try cooking it a little bit differently, it changes the flavor profile. Another thing you can do is use complementary foods. So, you can definitely eat more than just plain chicken, rice, and vegetables. That is like the classic renal diet, right? Plain chicken, rice, and vegetables. Other things you can do. So let's just talk about chicken, right? You can do chicken enchiladas, chicken stir fry bowls, homemade chicken ramen, chicken stuffed zucchini boats, chicken tacos, barbecue chicken sandwiches, chicken alfredo capsules. So you see we've taken one food, chicken, and we've turned it into all of these. Um, and hopefully there's at least one of these that you Feel like you could really enjoy. Um, and then you can think of a side dish, maybe, uh, you know, cilantro lime quinoa, corn on the cob, Italian eggplant salad, pineapple coleslaw, baked yellow squash, beet and cucumber salad, heavenly deviled eggs. You know, there's a lot of different foods that you could combine with those together. Sometimes you use the power of the internet to find some new recipes. Um, maybe you have cabbage in your fridge. I have a big purple cabbage in my fridge, so that's why I'm thinking of it because I need to use it this week before it goes bad. Um, and I bought it without meal planning. I was just like, I would really like purple cabbage this week. I don't have a plan yet for it, so I'm going to have to use the internet. What are some purple cabbage recipes that I can do? Am I going to roast it? Am I going to put it in a slaw? Like, how will I use that? So using some of these complementary foods where you are taking one food and then you use it in different ways, maybe you pair it with something different. Um, chicken enchiladas uh, paired with a pineapple coleslaw actually is really good. That pineapple salsa or a pineapple coleslaw with an uh, enchilada type recipe is awesome. Um, so definitely something you could do there. Last thing is use a seasoning. I have all my... All my clients are probably fourth lesson in uh, kind of the series that we walk through is we try one change that they implement is they try one new spice. They only pick one, one spice at the store. And either they just pick it at random when they're at the store and then they use Google to find out different ways to use it or we'll strategically plan for it. If you'll use one spice a month and just use it on different things and start to get familiar with the flavor, you'll learn how to use spices. Maybe your spice for the month is going to be basil. You know, traditionally we think of basil in hummus or we think of it in Italian dishes. But, you know, what if you put it on your green beans? What if you put basil on your chicken? Like, what if you put it with some lemon um, on your chicken? And people will just use that one spice and they'll start trying to cook it with a lot of different, uh, different foods and they start to learn what that flavor profile is. That's another great way to expand your diet because your foods take on a whole new personality. Really, really great thing. I will say one side note on basil real quick is I had some stored in my freezer. <clears throat> I thought it was spinach, and I threw it in a uh, chocolate smoothie. And basil and chocolate is a bad combination. So that is definitely something I do not recommend. Just to decrease your learning curve if basil is one you want to try. It does not go well with chocolate. Um, one thing to mention when you're trying to expand your diet uh, is that there's, there's a lot of power in the Internet and there's a lot of pitfalls in the Internet for sure. Um, the good is you can find a lot of different ideas. Knowing how to apply those ideas is where you can use your dietitian or using some, some practical knowledge. Um, it, there's, you know, there's so, so, so much information there and how you Google it and how you search for it can be great. 
even if you're not sure and maybe you just want a cabbage recipe, you can ask your dietitian to help you find one that can work for you. There's also a lot of online communities where you can get ideas. People have already tried and tested things and they'll post them for people to, to learn from. A lot of great patient support groups that are out there. Um, Facebook is very active in the renal community <clears throat> and a lot of people love to share their ideas um, on, on there. The bad is that not all recipes obviously are renal specific. They're obviously not specific to your individual plan, but that's where you can take an idea you like, you'd like to try, and then run it past your dietitian. Or you can use your own mind to say like, oh, okay, this has a lot of salt in it. Maybe I can cut it down a little bit. Maybe instead of tomatoes, I can use red peppers. I'm gonna give you a few of those uh, substitutions in just a second. And then always considering your sources. Not every source is going to be valid and have good information. Um, so consider where it's coming from. If it's a reputable organization, usually the information is very valuable. A couple of quick tips to navigate the internet, um, and then we just have a couple slides after this. If you find a recipe you want to try, then go for it. Usually what you have to do is just half the salt. Um, they tend to be a little bit salty, I found, or substitute a low-sodium vitamin. So if it just calls for black beans, use low-sodium black beans. Um, if it has high potassium foods and you have a potassium restriction, see if you can find a substitute. <clears throat> for example, um, a lot of recipes that call for a, just a regular orange, you can substitute pineapple in it. Um, a lot of recipes that call for tomatoes, you can use red peppers or roasted red peppers. Um, if you're not sure how it's going to fit in your diet, but you really want to try it, then talk to your dietitian. They usually can figure out either how much you can have of the original recipe or how to modify it so it works for your diet. Again, learn common substitutes, a few things I mentioned. Um, you know, what do you do instead of oranges? What do you do instead of bananas? What can you do instead of pumpkins? You know, what can you do instead of... Um, uh, what's one I just said? Uh, tomatoes. What are some substitutes I can use to still make those recipes taste good? Then you got to experiment. And then find some favorite websites to follow that can really help you hone in on some recipes. So in summary, three biggest mistakes that we see people do um, that causes too much restriction in their diet. Number one, they don't get enough produce. Um, they restrict that too much. Instead, understand what you can have and how much, and then you can expand your diet there. Number two, they don't use their labels effectively. So instead of just being scared of the food, <clears throat> learn about your labels. Have your dietitian teach you, use some of the tips we've learned today, and start you leveraging that advantage in the grocery store to find new products that are gonna work for you, because then you will also expand your diet. The, the third thing, mistake that people make is they stop experimenting. Um, they don't always mix up how they cook and what they cook with, or they don't cook at all. And you can really feel like your diet is quite restricted without a little bit of experimentation. Um, even if you're not cooking, even going to a different restaurant sometimes can be really helpful for you to try something new. So any questions that you may have? We have about 10 minutes left here, I believe. Happy to take them in the chat or unmuted lines. So actually, uh, one question yes. came in from someone that has um, diabetes and kidney disease. They're trying to decide um, what type of bread to buy that will satisfy both diets, and they're hearing um, conflicting things about each. So do you have any recommendations for the kind of bread that they can buy and um, if there's certain ingredients they should look for on the ingredients list? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, when you have diabetes and kidney disease, that is definitely a place where you're like, oh, which one do I do? So one thing that you'll, where a lot of the confusion comes there is that people will read on, lit, on renal lists that they should only have white bread. And then on their dialysis list, it'll say, or on their diabetes list, it says don't have white bread. The recommendation now, if you have a list that says only eat white bread, it's old, it's antiquated, like throw it out. 
whole grains were used to be restricted because of the phosphorus content. However, what they have found in the research and what we found in practice is that the phosphorus that's found in whole grains is bound up in the fiber, so you don't absorb all of it. So if your diabetes list says eat a whole grain bread, which is best because that fiber helps your blood sugar not shoot up so quickly, helps it stay a little bit more stable. If it says eat a whole grain bread, a whole grain bread would be best for you. Um, the one exception where I've seen some people get into trouble with before is with bran, like heavy bran products. I've seen some people have some problems with that bumping up their phosphorus on occasion. But outside of that, just a whole grain bread would be the best one for you to have. And obviously for all of us, anything with less added sugars is best. That's a great question. Thank you so much for asking that. Other questions that you all may have? Yes, this is Kathy while we're waiting for other sure. people to come up with their questions. Um, so I know people need to watch milk products. What about almond milk or soy milk or coconut milk? Um, oh, that's are, a really are they good question too. acceptable? Yeah, great question. So again, this is another place when you understand your label, you're just able to expand your diet, you know, quite a bit. So when it comes to any of the alternative milks, the main problem is just making sure they don't have extra phosphorus added to them. Um, and that's where you have to look in the ingredients. Um, I wonder if I can pop back here. Look in the ingredients and just make sure that it doesn't have added phosphates. Um, oh, here we go. So you always are going to know if it has an added phosphate if you see that PHOS, phos. So ferric orthophosphate, that's an added phosphate. With any of the nut milks, if you find one without an added phosphate, they're probably fine. They don't have a lot of almonds or cashews or nuts in them. It's really, they kind of uh, soak them and then strain out. I don't know if you've ever made your own nut milk. That's how they work it. The one uh, the one exception to that, and again, it just depends on the person, soy milk can be a little bit higher in potassium, um, but if you don't have a potassium restriction, it doesn't matter. So, yes, it just okay. leverage okay. your labels. You can find a lot of options out there that are really good. Okay, thanks. And applesauce is a, um, can be used for sugar, is that correct? In recipes? Uh, yeah, so I think it would depend on the recipe. You can't do a one-to-one -one substitution. So, for example, if you're making cookies and it calls for a cup of sugar and you put a cup of applesauce instead, you would find that the cookies would be very, very flat and very runny. Um, uh, oftentimes I'll see, yeah, so I'll see applesauce replaced for oil more frequently because the moisture content is the same. Um, so some people that are cutting down on calories or trying to cut out some fat, they'll use instead of a cup of oil in their, you know, in their banana bread or whatever, they'll use uh, a cup of applesauce or like in a cake mix recipe instead of a cup of half a cup of oil or half a cup of butter, they'll use half a cup of applesauce. Um, uh, you would be better off okay. for a sugar substitute to use either the a stevia or Splenda one-to-one -one substitutes if you're trying to cut back on the sugar intake. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions out there for Jeff? Okay, well, Jeff, I want to thank you personally for sharing uh, this hour with us. Um, I learned so much, and I somehow thought you must have been at my house with my cilantro that wilts in the refrigerator the very next day. Oh. So I had to smile when I heard that tip, which I will be using. Um, but thank you again. I always get lots of information and lots of tips from you. So really appreciate you joining us. Um, and I also want to encourage everyone to complete the feedback form that will come up. And then to start the new year, we will have a webinar on uh, finding grants and how do you find resources if you want to do your own business or you're looking to go back to school. 
um, join us on January 30th. The last Thursday of the month will be our times for next year, and they'll be at 2 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And again, Jess, thanks for being with us. Sure, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thank you, and wishing everyone a happy new year, and um, we'll talk.